if you're a home grower, you probably appreciate smaller orchids, especially if you don't have a greenhouse or if you don't have too much space. I have a lot of orchids with Cattleya eclandiae in them. I have a lot of hybrids that are vigorous, easy to grow, and I just find them so beautiful because they're spotted and I just find them so pretty. So today's video is going to be part one of a new series of species that shape modern orchid growing. And today we're going to focus on the Cattleya eclandiae. So let's get right into it. So the Eclandiae has been around for quite a long time. It was discovered in the 1800s and um, in the mid 1800s in the Victorian era, the popular uh, Cattleya orchids at the time were these bigger orchids like the Cattleya labiata, Cattleya mosiae of Venezuela, and the Cattleya warsawixii was another one. I believe that one's from Colombia, but these orchids were like much bigger. They were floofier, they had bigger flowers, and then the size was a lot taller, typically. Um, so when the Cattleya eclandiae was described, this was a lot different because it had a much smaller size. The flowers were waxy and they were spotted. They had a lot of substance compared to some of the other orchids. Those orchids were beautiful, but this was different and it was used and influenced a lot of hybrids. The Orchids that were also popular at the time were like very soft colored, they were white, they were pastel colored. Um, so this came through, this was brown, spotted, purple. It was completely different at the time. So getting into the history of this one, the first Eclandiae orchid was collected in Brazil in 1839. It was sent to England under the care of Lieutenant James flowered in cultivation in June, 1840. Um, this orchid is from the state of Bahia in Brazil, which tends to be quite hot and windy. And this grows in a specific region in Bahia. You can't find this anywhere else in the wild. So this was collected from there and then brought back to, brought back to Europe. The name of the species was formally described and published by John Lindley. I found a lot of weird stories about it on it being named after Lady Ackland. There were Harriet Ackland and then there was another Miss Ackland. And there I found a lot of different sources referring to different Acklands, <laughs> but I think we can come to the conclusion that the Acklandiae refers to the Ackland family name in their collection, which was common in Victorian botanical practice. Lindley, by the way, was a foundational figure in orchid growing in the Victorian times. And I'll make another video on the history of orchid growing where we can get into him. Okay, so this orchid, as I mentioned, is from the state of Bahia in the wild. And there's two ecological zones of this orchid, according to the American Orchid Society. There's uh, the coastal sea level Eclandiae a species that they have moderate heat very high rainfall. They grow primarily on mango trees. They have very strong pseudobulbs, hard yellow green foliage, and they're more floriferous. There's also a set of Eclandiae species that also grow further inland. And the conditions inland are much hotter, up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 and a half degrees Celsius. It rains, but intensely, but in short bursts. So the inland Eclandiae species, they get a lot of drought, a lot of dry period. Their growths tend to be a little bit weaker. The foliage is darker and they're less floriferous. So there's a lot of variety in Eclandiae's. And if you got one that was bred from a species from the coast, they tend to be a bit stronger than the ones that are inland. That being said, the ones inland, they're hardy. They survive quite a lot of conditions. It's very windy, it's pretty dry. When it rains, it pours. When it doesn't rain, it can sustain itself. So these orchids are quite tough. So there's a lot of cultivation variability and there's different growing experience depending on where they came from. So let's talk about their blooming behavior. In the wild, these orchids bloom four times a year. And and that's in their um, natural habitat where they, they tend to thrive. Um, so this orchid 
is very specific to a small region in Brazil, so it thrives in the conditions that it gets in Bahia. So if you're growing it indoors, you're gonna have a different experience. I find, I haven't bloomed this one yet, but I hear from a lot of growers, they don't bloom it as often, but this is in regards to how they grow in the wild in their perfect conditions. And I say perfect because it's the only area that they can be found and where they thrive. So whenever we're growing indoors, we're giving them different conditions. They're not getting the same wind openly. They're not getting the same heat typically. They, their air, their roots get a lot of air. If we're potting them up, they're getting air, but it's different. So we're gonna have different experiences indoors. Within cultivation, most folks typically get blooms once or twice per year of the species. The hybrids tend to have more vigor. We'll talk about those a little bit later, but the hybrids tend to bloom more often than the species. Now, what drives the flowers? Well, these thrive with very high light, higher than typical uh, Cattleya orchids. They, as I said, they get a lot of wind in the wild, so strong airflow is important for them. You gotta let them dry out between rain because in the wild they get strong bursts of rain and then they get very dry periods. So they have to dry out, they cannot stay wet for too long. And then they prefer to have warm temperatures year round. So if you're growing indoors, this room stays quite warm. It's 80 degrees in here right now. But if you give them warm temperatures year round, they will thrive and they're likely to give you more blooms. You can definitely grow these under lights. Just make sure they have a wet dry cycle and that they have some source of airflow and they will grow well for you. The brighter the light, the better. In terms of the genetics of the Cattleya clandiae, they're known for their spots. And I just find spotting beautiful on orchids. They have good fragrance too. And I just, they're just some of my favorites. Um, the genetic traits of the Cattleya clandiae are dominant spotting, strong substance, and compact habit. I find that the flowers are very waxy on these, and they tend to last a good amount of time. Whenever these orchids are crossed, there tends to be persistence among generations with the spotting. So the spotting remains visible, even several generations removed, and does not fade easily. So this has influenced quite a lot of hybrids over the years. So the Cattleya clandiae is a cornerstone species for a lot of miniature hybrids. It's used quite a lot and it's been used since the 1800s. There are natural hybrids of this orchid as well and that's when the orchids are in the wild in the same region and they can cross pollinate naturally. And the Cattleya facellus is one of the natural hybrids found in the wild in Bahia. There's been claims of some that are natural hybrids. I believe it's called the Cattleya Missourii. I'll put the name down below, but that one is a cross between the Cattleya clandiae and the Cattleya valkyriana. Someone made a claim years ago about that one, but that was debunked because Cattleya valkyriana is 500 miles away from the Cattleya eclandiae, so they could never naturally cross. So for natural hybrids, these orchids need to grow together in the same region. The Cattleya facellus is a cross between the Cattleya eclandiae and the Cattleya bicolor, and it retains spotting with increased vigor and size. And whenever you cross a species with another one, they tend to get more vigorous. The different traits tend to play off well with each other where they can sustain different sorts of conditions. My Cattleya facellus is very vigorous. It tends to grow quite fast. I got it as a seedling with this one, but that one started blooming for me two and a half years ago. This one I'm still waiting on. So that kind of gives you an idea of hybrid vigor. So let's talk about hybrids. I have quite a few of these because I really enjoy them. And in 1968, the American Orchid Society recorded 36 registered hybrids involving a clandier. And most of those were made before 1916, which is wild. So these have been around a very long time. There were 28 hybrids registered before 1916. I looked up the Royal Horticultural Society and searches, parent searches show extensive continued use, 108 seed parent hits and 148 pollen hits. This is not additive, you can interchange them, but that indicates well over 100 documented registrations over time. And of course, there's always unregistered hybrids everywhere. So this reflects the frequency and longevity of use. This adds a lot of vigor and a lot of spots to the flowers. 
And most importantly for me and other home growers, it's, it makes the size of orchids a lot smaller. It also adds beautiful fragrance to everything. So let's talk about some of the hybrids. So I'm still waiting to bloom my Eclandé for the first time. As I said, I've been growing this since it was a seedling, but I've bloomed many hybrids. Let's talk about a few of them and let's talk about some of the iconic hybrids as well. So the first one I wanna talk about is the Cattleya Princess Clementine, and that is a cross between the Cattleya Eclandiae and the Cattleya Dawiana. It was first sown in 1887, geez, well over 100 years before I was even born. It was first flowered in 1901 in Belgium. It was awarded, um, it was one of the first hybrids ever awarded, and it's frequently remade due to its historical importance. It combines the Cattleya Eclandiae spotting with the Dawiana color and substance. And there was an opportunity for me to get one of these and because my collection is so big, I declined on getting it and I regret it. So Michael McCarthy, who gave me a nudge, you said, it's just one, Nicole, you need to get it. I do regret it. So I wish I got that one. It's a very beautiful Cattleya orchid and it's been around for 140 years almost at this point, which is wild to me. Let's talk about the very first Cattleya Eclandiae hybrid ever registered, and that's the Cattleya Brabantiae. And that is a cross between the Cattleya Eclandiae and the Cattleya Lodigesiae. And I had the privilege of going through an insert of the AOS, um, I believe it's October 2020. They made a spotted Cattleya insert and they had a bunch of these and they were so beautiful. So if you guys are a member of AOS, I highly recommend you check it out. You might buy way more orchids, but I saw the Brabantia in there and it's so beautiful. It's a spotted pink orchid, small, beautiful lip, has a bit of the Eclandia, has a bit of the Lodigesia, and it's just so beautiful. And this was the very first um, hybrid registered with Eclandia, and it was done in 1863. It's one of the earliest recorded man-made Eclandia hybrids. And it's another one that was an early example of breeder recognition of the Eclandiae's value, so it kept getting crossed after that. Another one that stood out to me is the Cattleya Little Leopard, and that is Cattleya Eclandiae by Cattleya Amistoglo Amistoglosa. I think I said that wrong, but this was actually made by Mr. Redlinger, who I mentioned in my Richard Mueller video, if you want to check that out. But this is another very beautiful orchid. It was crossed in the 60s, it was in an AOS article, very beautiful orchid, and the name reflects the leopard style spotting from the Eclandiae. It's another very pretty one. Pink with spots, just so beautiful. Pink is one of my favorite colors, so. If I come across the Cattleya Little Leopard, I'll probably pick one up. Very pretty, and just goes to show some of these orchid breeders of the 60s, they're iconic and their names aren't well known and they come up repeatedly. So Mr. Redlinger made this beautiful cross in the, when he had his nursery in Miami and it was, he was doing some pretty cool things at the time. Another famous Cattleya cross is the Cattleya Small World. I used to have that orchid. I got it from Gold Country Orchids a while back, but it's a small one. It's so pretty. It's a cross between the Cattleya Eclandiae and the Cattleya Luteola, which is another very small orchid. Unfortunately, I didn't have it too long. I put it in semi-hydro and it didn't like it. The Luteola for me is a little bit finicky, but I'll tell you, it has a beautiful lip. It stays nice and small. It was just so pretty. This is a widely cited miniature Cattleya orchid. And um, if you guys are into these, I find that gold country orchids often stock some and and they're breeders of miniature Cattleyas. That's where I got my Cattleya Jungle Eyes as well, which is another um, hybrid with the Jungle Elf. They're very pretty, and again, they stay quite small. They have that spotting, and they're gorgeous. Another cross that I wanna mention that's super common is the Cattleya Hippodamia, and that is a cross between the Cattleya Eclandiae and the Cattleya Nodosa, and I actually have my Nodosa in bloom. I don't know if you could see it here on the edge, but that is also another very vigorous species, and that's two species crossed together that are quite small, they don't get too big, and that one blooms quite a lot. So whenever you cross different hybrids together, they make a wonderful vigorous orchid that blooms many times. So 
In closing, although I haven't bloomed this one yet, I'm very excited to bloom it for the first time. I'm gonna be over the moon. This is a cerulea version. I have quite a lot of uh, hybrids with it that have bloomed many times. There's so many in doing research that I wanna get. I wanna get the small world again. It's pretty, they have spots. The fragrance is always so nice. In the case of the Facelis, it blooms multiple times per year. I don't think they're as vigorous as my Richard Mueller hybrids, but they come in at a close second. The Richard Mueller hybrids can bloom five and six times per year, and I find that these can bloom three and four times per year, um, sometimes two times per year, which is quite nice. The species indoors tend to bloom once or twice per year, and that's because we don't have the conditions that they get in the wild. So. It is what it is in that regard, but we do our best as home growers to mimic how they grow. So the Cattleya clandiae is a small species that has had a big impact on the orchid world. There's so many hybrids that have been made with it, and it's very influential, especially with the compact Cattleya orchids. This is just part one of a series. Maybe the next one will be the Cattleya valkyriana, um, but we'll get into more uh, species and how they've influenced modern orchid growing because behind every hybrid there is a plant that once grew in the wild and some of them are no longer found in the wild which is a little sad but we cultivate them indoors we can now clone them we can now um, cross them they add vigor to so much in our collections and we enjoy them for many years i hope you guys enjoyed this video let me know what other kinds of species you want to see in this and i will see you in the next one bye everyone